Right, whoa, yes. <laughs> I pressed the right button. <laughs> this is, uh, as in the immortal words of the film Notting Hill, this is surreal but nice uh, to be back. It's actually 16 years, Ollie, uh, since I was on staff here uh, when we went to the Gulf to build an international church. But it's just so great to be back with familiar and some unfamiliar faces as well. And uh, it's my huge privilege to be able to uh, unpack the beginning of a beautiful story, a beautiful book of the Old Testament, the book of Ruth. And I suspect that you know the story well, but you know there are so many themes in the book of Ruth which foreshadow Jesus, which talk about the goodness of God. It's a precious little book. I, I kind of call it a novella. It's a short story, but if you don't know it, you're in for a treat over this next few weeks because uh, we're going to unpack the meaning behind the book of Ruth. So without further ado, let me pray. And if you've got your Bibles with you, turn to Ruth chapter one, or does it magically appear behind me? I'm not sure, probably does. So um, let me pray and, uh, and let's get straight into this. Lord, we thank you for the beautiful songs that we've been able to sing this morning. We thank you for the truth set to music, which stirs the heart, stirs the mind, stirs the soul. Lord, we thank you that your name is to be blessed whatever season of our lives. And we're so aware as we come out of the strangeness of the world we've been living in that we are going to bless your name in the good times and the bad because you are utterly faithful. And that's what this book's all about, your faithfulness. And so, Lord, we pray now for the eyes of our hearts to be opened up. Would you illuminate the, the scriptures? Would you show us your beauty and your glory afresh this morning? We, we're so hungry for you. We're so thirsty to know you more. We're so aware of our shortcomings. We're so aware of our weakness, but we know that you are the bread of life. And we want to take you into ourselves this morning. We want to partake of your heavenly presence. We want your presence in our hearts and minds and souls again afresh. So help us, Lord, as we uh, look at this beautiful first chapter of Ruth. In your wonderful son's name, amen. Okay, so um, I'm going to read to you Ruth chapter 1. Um, and the title of uh, this first uh, talk on Ruth is called Life's bitter blows. And actually, the, the book of Ruth is very, very apposite, very appropriate for the sort of world that we've been living in. Um, chapter one's a tough old chapter, as you're about to see. So I'm going to read to you from the New International Version, the UK edition, as it were. Okay, here we go. Naomi loses her husband and sons. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. So a man from Bethlehem in Judah, together with his wife and two sons, went to live for a while in the country of Moab. The man's name was Elimelech, his wife's name was Naomi, and the names of his two sons were Mahlon and Kilion. They were Epaphrathites from Bethlehem, Judah, and they went to Moab and lived there. Now Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left with her two sons. They married Moabite women, one named Orpah, the other Ruth. After they'd lived there for about 10 years, both Mahlon and Kilian also died. And Naomi was left without her two sons and her husband. When Naomi heard in Moab that the Lord had come to the aid of his people by providing food for them, she and her daughters-in-law prepared to return home from there. With her two daughters-in-law, she left the place where she'd been living and set out on the road that would take them back to the land of Judah. And then Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go back, each of you, to your mother's home. May the Lord show you kindness, as you've shown kindness to your dead husbands and to me. May the Lord grant that each of you will find rest in the home of another husband. And then she kissed them goodbye, and they wept aloud and said to her, we will go back with you to your people. But Naomi said, return home, my daughters. Why would you come with me? Am I going to have any more sons who would become your husbands? Return home, my daughters. Uh, I, I'm, I'm too old to have another husband. And even if I thought there was still hope for me, even if I had a husband tonight and then gave birth to sons, would you wait till they grew up? Would you remain unmarried for them? No, my daughters. It's more bitter 
for me than for you because the Lord's hand has turned against me. At this they wept aloud again. Then Orpah kissed her mother-in-law goodbye, but Ruth clung to her. Look, said Naomi, your sister-in-law is going back to her people and to her gods. Go back with her. But Ruth replied, don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go, and where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people, and your God, my God. And where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if even death separates you and me. When Naomi realized that Ruth was determined to go with her, she stopped urging her. So the two women went on till they came to Bethlehem. And when they arrived in Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them. And the women exclaimed, can this be Naomi? Don't call me Naomi, she told them. Call me Mara, because the Lord Almighty has made my life very bitter. I went away full but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi? The Lord has afflicted me. The Almighty has brought misfortune upon me. So Naomi returned from Moab, accompanied by Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law, arriving in Bethlehem. I'm a little sound effect now. Just as the barley harvest was beginning. Important point, as those of you who know the story well. What a story, what a start, what a chapter. A profoundly human story. So much that we can identify with straight away. We can immediately identify with Naomi because of life's tragic blows. We know of people, and it may be in our own families, that we, ha we have hit tragedy. Uh, the COVID days have affected the whole planet, including this town. But this beautiful little story of two, two women, Naomi and Ruth, this amazing man, Boaz, who turns up later, who becomes Ruth's husband. There's a charming simplicity about this beautiful story. It's got a simple plot, but really, you know, I kind of got back engaged in it as I was reading it to you. It immediately engages you. Um, and yet, from a simple story, there are some of the most important themes that you'll find anywhere in the Bible. Here's the basic plot outline that you'll hear over the next few weeks, that Elimelech takes his wife, Naomi. We realize that there's this double tragedy that's happened, and Naomi is now a lonely, aging widow in a foreign land, cruelly, cruelly robbed of loved ones by death. And this is a family of four that shrunk to one, and if you think about it, there's no greater tragedy in Israel than for your family line to run out. This is... Uh, now, um, a brink of extinction, if you like. And Naomi seriously lacks options. I wonder if you're feeling something like that this morning, that you feel that the options in your life have been curtailed and curtailed and curtailed to the point where you think, actually, Naomi, I kind of get where you are at this point in time. Her fate is very bitter indeed. I feel God is going to be very pastoral with us this morning. He's going to speak directly into our hearts about ourselves and our reactions to life's bitter blows. And this is how chapter one unfolds. I can't duck it. We've got to talk about it. Um, but let's look at very quickly at some of the uh, themes of this book because I love this story. It's got a blissful ending, but it doesn't start like this. It's got suspense. It's got characterization. It's got a plot line. It's a gem of a book. Let me rattle through some themes that I won't necessarily be touching on, but others will, okay? There's a big theme right from the start, which we heard in verse 8. It's that word, kindness. And the word kindness in Hebrew is chesed. You probably know that word. And very difficult to translate into English, but it basically means this. It's about love. It's about kindness. It's about loyalty. Chesed means covenant relationship, goodness, benevolence. This is the synonym for our God. Chesed. That's what he's really like. And this kindness goes all the way through the book. Another theme is from emptiness to fullness. 
So maybe you came here this morning feeling really quite empty. Perhaps you're thinking, I'm glad I'm wearing a mask because actually my heart is empty and I'm glad you can't really see my face. My eyes, there's a deadness behind my eyes. I'm struggling. I feel I'm empty. Well, this is a book all about emptiness to fullness. By the end of the story, there is complete fulfillment, even though Naomi, at the start of this story, is emptied of everything she has. All her resources have gone. Maybe you're feeling a bit like that this morning. And yet, by the end of the book, talk about fullness. The women in Bethlehem say, do you know what? Um, <laughs> you, you've got a complete turnaround of events. You've got a daughter-in-law who's worth more than seven sons to you. Isn't that amazing? Talk about over-the-top blessing after losing two sons. And yet, she's gone through life's bitter blows. Her name, Naomi, means lovely or pleasant, but she's saying, don't call me that anymore. So you've got this amazing idea of emptiness through to fullness. A third theme might be famine. Years of famine, it starts because of famine. There's no food in Bethlehem. Ironically called, Bethlehem means house of bread. There's no food there. It's a famine. And somehow, even through famine, God is working his purposes out. Is it a famine in your life at the moment? You feel, Lord, you haven't spoken to me for months, it feels. I'm re plodding on in the word. I'm praying, sealing. Come on, God, talk to me. Famine. Maybe it's your job. Maybe it's your health. It could be anything. A relationship that just won't click back into place. Famine. Years of famine, drought, and yet the promise all the way through the Bible is always that your leaves will stay green in famine. This is a promise to us. We hold through years of famine. For a fourth theme, that wasn't easy to say, fourth theme, grief, loss, bereavement, subsequent loneliness. The Lord is tender-hearted. The Lord is very, very close to the brokenhearted. Do you believe that? Very, very close. There's a fifth theme, and I love this one really goes to me. This is the glimpse of the church emerging here in the book of Ruth, the international church, because you've got Naomi, a Jew, and you've got Beth, uh, Ruth, a Gentile from Moab, and they're walking together back into Bethlehem, a Jew and a Gentile. And they're eventually going to prefigure Ephesians chapter 2, verse 15, that says this, God's purposes through Christ was to create in himself one new humanity, Jew and Gentile. You've got Ruth and you've got Naomi, one new humanity, prefigured in the book of Ruth. Isn't that exciting? That speaks to me. I love, I love the whole, I mean, I think of Israel and Palestine now without getting at all political. Dear Lord, Ephesians 2.15, right now for the Holy Land, the Jew and the Gentile, Lord, bring it through Christ, the hostility, break it down, Lord. It's, break, it's here in Ruth. Another theme, and I love this one, is the constant hidden providence of God. Constant hidden providence. Providence is stalking you, if I can use that expression, <laughs> following you all the days of your life. You are being followed by hidden providence. And it's worked out, what I love about Ruth is it's worked out in ordinary lives. You can't really call anybody evil in the book of Ruth. Even the guy who doesn't want to marry Ruth and allows Boaz to marry her, he's not a bad man. He just thinks, man, I've got to look after my own family. There's no one evil and nasty in the book of Ruth. These are very ordinary people. You don't get any miracles in the book of Ruth. You don't get supernatural developments. You don't get visions. You don't get audible voices from heaven. You just get ordinary people in the outworking of their lives, just like you and me. God works through the ordinary circumstances of our lives. Isn't that thrilling? We need to remember that again. We don't need to go to the mountaintop. He's with us at the washing up bowl. He's really up close and personal. And these are the very scenarios where God chooses to operate. Do you believe that? Do you think, no, I'm too ordinary. I'm too hidden away. There's nothing happening in my life. Uh -uh. This is the very theater of war, if you like. The theater of where God's action takes place. Ordinary people, just like you and me. And we've got Ruth. 
the only non-Israelite in the Old Testament with a book named after her. And she, although this is a very ordinary story, she is extraordinary in her courage and her loyalty and her godliness. A couple more themes and I'll quickly point out chapter one. Theme of genealogy. You can't miss it in Ruth. It's too exciting. I'll just mention it. The family tree that comes from the union of Ruth and Boaz produces King David. Ruth is granny to King David. Man, that's a destiny. Do you wonder about yourself? What's my life producing? What's the fruit from my life? I feel so ordinary today. I feel so tucked away in a corner. Well, hey, Ruth, the Moabitess, grandmother to King David. And of course, as you well know, I'm sure, this eventually leads to the genealogy of Jesus in Matthew chapter 1. Ruth's there in Matthew 1. She's along with other interesting women, and it's often the broken women and the, the outcast. You've got, you've got um, Rahab, you know, an immoral woman. You've got Tamar, I had tough stuff happen to her. You've got Mary, who was accused of illegitimacy. You've got Ruth. You've got women in chapter 1 of Matthew who are very special women to God. And then one final theme is this about, I can't miss this one, Boaz is described as a kinsman redeemer. And the Hebrew word goel, others will unpack for you. But this is prefiguring another mighty kinsman, kinsman redeemer. You know who I'm talking about, the Lord Jesus himself. So let's pick up very briefly some things in chapter one, okay? So if you've got your Bible in front of you, Naomi, as we've said, is in serious trouble. She's got no protection from her husband, and that's a patriarchal society she's living in. Man, this is total loss for Naomi. And there's really a sense in which there's only something God can do now. But here's the interesting thing, that Naomi is blaming God all the way through chapter one. And I wonder if you're feeling the same at the moment. That um, you're saying, Lord, my faith is hanging on by a thread with you. I still believe in you, but I'm going to blame you. And you know, God is big enough. The Bible is so radically honest, and it's such a, an amazing book because it copes with all our blame and our anger at God for the life circumstances that we've gone through. And Naomi, in verse 8, says to Ruth, may the Lord show kindness to you. It's kind of saying, I kind of know God's still intimately involved in what's going on in this tragedy. It kind of, by saying this to you, that God will show you kindness, I think he still cares about the people involved in this tragedy. She's hanging on, just about. And yet... And, and verse 9 is so hard to read. Uh, Ruth kisses her daughters goodbye, and they're weeping aloud. This is emotionally packed, and often we hide our emotions away. You know, we, we go away and grieve in quiet, but we go away and we don't tell people how we're really feeling, but these are people weeping aloud. We need, perhaps we need to weep aloud a bit more with each other and say, look, help me, help me. This is, this is tough. I can't, I can't deal with this on my own. And then we must look at her bitterness, how she explains her loss of hope. She's basically saying, I accuse God himself. I hold God responsible for my losses. This is so dangerous, and yet she's so safe that God is, loves her and will turn her circumstances round. Now, notice what happens to the two daughters-in-law. Orpah goes back to Moab, and the author of Ruth, some think it was Samuel, we're not sure. The author doesn't criticize Orpah. You notice that? She, she does the sensible thing. She does what you would expect her to do, to go back because she's done nothing wrong and she's got the chance of remarriage. And so there's a gentleness here about Orpah. Don't, don't give her a hard time. So sometimes, you know, we think, well, am I going to just do the just do the expected thing. But the point is this, it's the contrast between R Ruth and Orpah that's so stunning. It's not Orpah who's made a mistake. It's Ruth's amazing commitment to Naomi. One commentator puts it like this. When Ruth gives her majestic reply to her mother-in-law, 
one commentator says this, this is a formal pledge of commitment. It is amongst the highest expressions of commitment anywhere in scripture. It's often used at weddings. Ruth resists all pressures to break the relationship and commits to the other person, Naomi, for life. Now, I want us to go fast forward into the New Testament and right to today and us and the Lord. You may have gone through some of the most difficult times of your life in this last year. And I feel like I just want to say this to the Lord Jesus myself as a disciple. I wonder if you can say this with me. <laughs> Don't let the pressure of my circumstances leave you, Lord Jesus. I'm not going to turn back from following you. Where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Everywhere you will be, I will be. Say this to the Lord. Your people are my people, the church. Your God, my Father in heaven. Your Father in heaven, Lord Jesus, is my Father. Where you die, I will die. I will pick up my cross and I will die to the world and I will be crucified with Christ and I will follow you to the day of my death. And then I will give you a solemn oath like Ruth, Lord Jesus. Thus may Yahweh deal with me ever so severely if anything but death separates you and me. That's my covenant language to you, Lord Jesus. How are you doing with that? Total commitment from Ruth to Naomi. And you know what? It, you notice in chapter one, she's speechless. She hasn't got anything to say. She's been bitter, but it, it stops her. She's speechless. There's something so extraordinary about this in contrast to Orpah's sensible move. We need to become, is there a word, unsensible? We've got to keep on our radical edge of following him. We've got to be reckless. We've got to go with him into the uncertain future. Here's another quote from another commentator. Ruth gambles the security of the familiar for the uncertainty of the unfamiliar. You may be in unfamiliar circumstances now. That's probably, no, it is the safest place for you to be as you trust him. And yet... Chapter 1 still ends bitterly. Now, this is why this is such a human story. So she says this, Naomi says this when she comes back. She says, I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. She's blaming him still. It's okay to rant at God. And then she uses that, that one three-letter word that you and I use all the time. Why call me Naomi? Why, why, why have these things happened to me? And we have to wrestle with that, don't we? Oh, God, why? Maybe you're asking why at this point in time. Why is this, why is this happening? And here's a phrase I got from another commentator. That ancient cosmic troublemaker, God himself, has brought misfortune upon me, says Naomi. And yet look how the chapter ends. Just as the barley harvest is beginning, they come back into Bethlehem. And if you know the story, you will know that Ruth will go out into the barley fields and she will meet her future husband. And the astonishing blessing that comes out of that last chapter of Ruth will be hers. So it's the chapter that ends with bitterness and whoever gets to preach on chapter 4, it will end in bliss and the fulfillment of all the goodness of God. So we hold on. Amen? Let me just give you four lessons from this, and then I want to stop now, and I want us to pray and minister, and perhaps, Rich, if you can come back after that. All right. I feel God wants to say this to some people here today. This is very upfront and up close and personal to you now. So it's great to have as many people in the room as possible because God wants, is tender with us today. He knows what you're going through. He's drawing you to himself. Can you not feel him draw you to himself? And say, hold on, don't believe these present circumstances. Don't you dare interpret your world in your finite understanding. Okay, four lessons for us. You ready? 
Lesson number one. Do you have low expectations? Or even none at all from God right now or from life? Have you given in to what you, you might call common sense? My common sense tells me that this is all I can expect. Have you given in to your, your version of common sense? Is this your reality right now? That God won't intervene for you? This is what Naomi is coming up against, her expectations. They are low to the point of non-existent. What about you? Where are your expectations in God this morning? After a year and three months of what we've gone through. And whatever has happened to you, I don't know all your circumstances. Number two, ends and beginnings. Ends and beginnings. Naomi went away, but she came back. That took courage. It was the end of something really big in her life, away with her husband and two sons and two daughters-in-law. But it was the start of something else. Little did she realize it. Little did she know what was going to happen to her. Now, are we incapable of understanding fresh beginnings in our lives? Have we got to that bitter point where we say, this is actually just an end? Can I see a beginning beyond my end? The book of Ruth is all about that. Where are you with your ends and your beginnings? Has God shut something down in your life? Do you, do you see a little crack in the door of light under the door? That maybe, just maybe, my, get away from me, common sense. Get away from me. I trust in the Lord. Psalm 91. You're in charge. I'm mean, in Psalm 91, even though it says you won't even stub your toe. Have you noticed that in Psalm 91? Just picking up on what you read, Ollie. Actually, then says, I'll be with you in trouble. So you might stub your toe in Psalm 91 because God will be with you all the way through your troubles. Okay, so <laughs> I mustn't get distracted by Psalm 91. Third point. So low expectations, ends and beginnings. I'm nearly done now, okay? See the bigger picture. Not in her wildest dreams did Naomi think that she would end up so blessed that her friends would say, you know, your life is completely renewed. You know, he, he who loves, she who loves you, your, uh, Ruth, your daughter-in-law, is better to you than seven sons. And you'll notice at the end, Naomi takes the baby in her lap, just as, just as Ads has come up with his little girl. Naomi takes the child and lays him in her lap and cares for him. And all her hurt is washed away. She's healed inside. And the women there actually say, Naomi has a son, not Ruth. How extravagant does that blessing feel? This is kind of like my son. So it goes beyond reason, the blessing of God. It's beyond rational. It's beyond your wildest dreams. Can you see, do you believe that there is a bigger picture for you today? Or are you stuck in your common sense that tells you otherwise? And my last thing is this, and I think this is definitely for some people here today. I, find, I feel this very strongly. Are you ready? Okay. Come home. Only God can fill your emptiness. Only God can meet your deepest needs. Come back, if you must, empty. Come back, if you must, with small expectations. Come back bitter if you must, but come back. Come back to God. Come home. Okay, let's pray. Perhaps you could just start playing quietly, Rich. Okay, let's just be before God now. This is such a challenging chapter. And our hearts are struggling. Lord Jesus, just I pray now for my dear friends. Holy Spirit, 
I invite you to come and flood this auditorium now with your presence, even more than you were here two minutes ago. Holy Spirit, come upon us. We're now going to do some surrendering. Surrendering of our own understanding. Surrendering of our own limited way of thinking. We're coming back to faith in the goodness of God, the chesed of God, which is everlasting to everlasting. I just want you now to offer back to God some dashed hopes. We've all got them, myself included. We've all got them. But they must not be a barrier between us and our God. Come, Holy Spirit, and minister deep into hearts. And I pray for you to breathe on our hopes again. Breathe on disappointed dreams. Breathe upon our turning in on ourselves and enable us again to receive divine power and strength to live the way we know we really want to live trusting in you with uh, abandon to the future and seeing your goodness come in the land of the living in our circumstances come holy spirit and minister us now as we break bread and worship thank you lord <laughs>